Chapter 5 Really? Molson looked at her in surprise. It ain't been much of a date. No dinner, no fancy flowers or nothing. I like this better, admitted Holly. I feel like I got to know more about you tonight than the entire time we've talked before. Is that a good thing? he asked. Very. Holly reached up, lightly giving him a kiss. She could admit to herself that she could slip into love with Molson after tonight. He had shown how caring he was, how dedicated to helping others he could be. He was an amazing person. You do realize what this means, murmured Molson. What? questioned Holly. You kiss me. That means I'm free to touch and kiss you again, he gave a lazy smile. It does, agreed Holly. However, not tonight. My feet are asking for an Epsom bath soaking. We need to get this done. Only two more stops, Molson promised. Good. Holly started dragging her cart again. They went in at an apartment building. It was dank, and not all the lights were working. Molson knocked on a door. So far, all their stops had been out of doors. Holly did not like the unsafe feeling the apartment hallway gave off as people lounged in their doorways, watching them. At the second knock, a mousy little man opened the door. Ah, Molson. Hey, Chi, Molson greeted him. They entered the apartment, which was little more than a studio apartment without any furniture. There were sleeping bags and blankets all over the floor. Twelve people crowded into the room, some of them playing a game in a corner. Chi bowed to Holly. Hi. Holly gave him a nervous smile, glad to be out of the hallway, but overwhelmed by the smell of something cooking on the stove. No food, Molson told Holly as Chi solemnly watched her. His pride won't let the family take it. They look very thin, softly observed Holly. We respect their custom. Molson was approached by a little boy. He crouched down. Hey, Tud. Hey, Molson, the little boy said back, carefully enunciating. Molson was allowed to check the children. He mimed what they were supposed to do with any ointments or medications. He gave diabetic supplies to one of the teenage girls. Are they legal? Holly asked quietly as they left the apartment building again. Who knows, responded Molson. Two years ago, Chi brought Cola to me. She's the diabetic girl. They hadn't known she had diabetes. His family was kicked out of their community because Chi had chosen outside medical advice rather than let the local shaman deal with it. Shaman? Holly said disbelievingly. You're kidding. Nope. Molson was serious. Chi's family believes in tradition and hokey magic. It's still sometimes a struggle to get them to understand that she's not going to ever be cured. Do all of them live in that apartment together? She wondered. Yep. They handed out the last of the food at a local small park that had seen much better days. Holly saw a group of kids hanging out near the basketball court. Don't look, Molson advised her. They're dealing. The less you see, the better. They're just kids, noted a concerned Holly. Yep. Molson didn't like it either. And they ain't no good. Don't look, don't talk to them. They got a reputation for bad things. What about calling the cops on them, she wondered. No way, he told her. If word gets out that you're with me and you ratted on them, I ain't never going to be allowed back in any of the territories. All the help I give, that'd be over with one phone call. Done. How would they know it was me? Holly did not like the thought of just leaving it. Some of those kids were barely teenagers. If they got caught, maybe they would get some help. People talk. Molson turned her to face him. It'll get out somehow. I know you want to help them. I want to help them. They ain't ready to be helped. When they are, they'll come to us. I still think someone should stop them, she said stubbornly. Not you, Molson told her evenly. You know what happens to snitches? No, she frowned. Not good things. Molson chose not to elaborate too much. I don't feel like taking a beat down. Leave them alone. Maybe someday one of them will come over to us, wanting to get out. How likely do you think that is? She questioned. Not too likely, admitted Molson. Gang culture was one where fear was a strong motivator to remain with the group. The only thing I can do is keep helping people here at the park. 
and hope that if they need something and want a better life, they'll ask. It's not right, Holly said softly. No, it's not right. It's not fair, agreed Molson. It's a choice. Get a couple kids caught by the cops, have them thrown in juvie where it'll be a minor inconvenience to them, then lose the opportunity I've created to help the nearly hundred other people we met tonight, or ignore them and keep helping these people. Holly hooked her arm through his again as they walked. Then it's really no choice at all. Sure it is. I just choose to help the most people. Molson watched her fondly. How's your feet? Sore, Holly admitted with a smile. You did good tonight, he complimented her. So did you. She leaned on him a little, enjoying walking through the city with him. A yawn escaped her, and Holly looked at her watch, surprised at the time. It's very late. I think it's early. Molson estimated it was near one in the morning. He enjoyed the feeling of Holly on his arm. She reacted much better than he had hoped, being his assistant for the night. At the soup kitchen, they locked the carts and totes in a little back shed. When do you find the time to sleep? Holly yawned again. Between this, working, and the hospital, you must be incredibly busy. He had not even mentioned taking care of Margot. Then again, Molson was not too sure he wanted to introduce Holly to his mother. She might think insanity ran in the family. I sleep whenever and wherever I can, replied Molson. Power naps are my superpower. Here I thought being a nice guy was your superpower, Holly smiled. Maybe that too. He gave a lazy grin. A movement caught his eye and his smile slowly faded. Wait here. Stay in the light. Where are you going? Holly quickly asked, uneasy by his sudden change in demeanor. Just stay here. Molson walked quickly to the edge of the parking lot where another man waited. Who's the pretty lady? the man wondered. None of your concern, Guan. Molson frowned. What did you hear? Us says he'll meet. Juan gave Molson an assessing look. Club 40, back booth. When? he asked cautiously. Molson did not want to seem over-enthusiastic. He only hoped he could convince Huss to do as he asked. Tonight, Guan tapped his non-existent watch. Club 40 closes in 50 minutes. That's your window. Okay. Molson did not have to ask what would have happened if Guan had not found him. Probably he would never have had the chance to speak to Huss again. It was not every day that someone like him, a relative nobody, met with one of the kings. Not wasting time, Molson went straight back to Holly, then realized he would not have time to drop her off and make it back to the club before it closed. What was that about? she wanted to know. We got one more stop, Molson said reluctantly. Molson, it's late. I would like to go home, sighed Holly. Is it really important, or can it wait till tomorrow? It has to happen tonight, grimaced Molson. He hated to disappoint her. I got a meeting with one of the top gang members. Molson! Holly was shocked. This is dangerous. A gang leader? If I can get the leaders of each gang to testify that it was David that imported the drugs, not Michael, then they'll be both back where they belong. David in prison, Michael out, Molson explained. Will they testify? Holly was intrigued by the idea. She remembered Molson had raised the idea before, talking to gang members to see if they could clear Michael's name. Will they implicate themselves if they testify? They would, reluctantly responded Molson. I've been talking to Drew. We're hoping that in return for testimony, the FBI will give them immunity from prosecution. Only for what they say in this particular case, nothing else. Can the FBI do that? she questioned. They can if the courts agree to it, he told her. Trouble is, we don't know if we can get them to testify or if the FBI will agree to the deal. But why would they testify? Holly's brows drew together as she frowned. What's in it for them? They would want some sort of exchange for their testimony, right? I'm hoping I can appeal to their better nature. Molson shrugged. Some of them I've helped with medical stuff. I don't know if it will be enough to remind them of that. Probably not, but I gotta try. Huss says he'll meet tonight, so I'll just have to do the best I can to convince him. 
Then we'd better get going. Holly went for the bike. You are going to stay right beside me the whole time, Molson warned her as he handed Holly a helmet. Don't even think of going to the bathroom or nothing. Where we're going, it's not a place for you to be. If I had time to drop you off somewhere, I would. You do have an interesting idea of a first date. Holly pulled the helmet on. Molson decided not to answer that. He hoped the next time they went out, they actually had a normal date. He would like that. Dinner, flowers, maybe a little music. Some place normal people went, or maybe since he was pretty broke, some place private. Not that he had some place he could bring her to since he was couch surfing. Not exactly a cool thing at his age. Pulling up to the club, Molson took a deep breath. He hoped he had not made a colossal error bringing Holly here. It was not like he had any guarantee that Huss would listen to him, or he might decide Molson was stepping out of his place and needed a firm touch to put him back where he belonged. Molson would hate to get a beat down in front of Holly. If they hit me, you stay out of it, Molson grimly told her. What? Holly pulled off her helmet, looking at him in surprise. You're not serious. I hope not. Molson stowed away the headgear. Just stay clear if anything goes down. Are you sure we should do this? Holly asked in consternation. If it's too dangerous, we can just not go in there. Holly, ain't nobody else gonna do it. He put his hands on her shoulders, trying to reassure her. This is the only way I can see to help Michael. If you got any better ideas, I'm all ears. Best case scenario, Huss will think about it. Most likely he'll just laugh us out of the club. Worst case, I get a thrashing for being nervy enough to ask him to rat out David. Worst case, Huss decided to dust him. Molson decided not to mention that option. He was fairly certain Huss would not do that. Huss did not have a reputation of having a hot temper or doing things lightly. That was why Molson had hoped to approach him first. Come on. Molson took Holly by the hand. The building was jumping with dancers, servers, and people hanging out. The music was loud. Lights flashed in the darkness. Holly was glad she had Molson's hand firmly in hers. Otherwise, she would be afraid of losing him. The crowd was so thick. It had to be against fire code. Someone pushed into her, and she stumbled. Molson was there, wrapping an arm around her, pulling her along. He shouted something into her ear, but Holly could not hear. She wondered how they were going to have a meeting if no one could speak above the music. At the back of the building, they were ushered through a door. It seemed bright after the dance floor, yet it was only dimly lit inside. When the door shut, the music was down to a manageable level. A man looked them up and down. Who is she? She's with me. Molson kept hold of her hand. She can't go to your meeting, the man decided. She comes with me or there's no meeting. Molson's tone brooked no argument. There's no meeting, the man shrugged. This was at your request, not Huss's. What if I stayed right here, asked Holly. I could wait until Molson's done talking to Huss. You can keep an eye on me the entire time. Holly, Molson gritted his teeth. That will work, the man pointed to a chair. You can sit right there. See? Holly sat down with a brave smile. I'll be right here waiting for you. Molson did not like it, but the only other option was to not have the meeting. The man gestured for Molson to keep going down the hall. After a brief hesitation, Molson went where he was guided to. Another man waited. This one frisked him, checking for any wires or weapons. Molson gave up the single jackknife that he carried in his pocket. It wasn't worth much as a weapon. He used it mainly as a simple tool. Molson was led into a dimly lit room. There was a booth where Huss and a couple of his associates were having drinks. They cleared out when he approached, leaving only Molson, Huss, and a couple of men a respectful distance away, providing security. I considered your request to talk very carefully, began Huss. I remember your help when we brought Aaron to you. He was my cousin. You have ten minutes of my time. Aaron had been brought to him with a gunshot wound. Molson had helped without asking questions. 
He knew that no one had wanted the man to go to the hospital, where questions would be raised, the cops would become involved, and it was possible that someone might get arrested. Molson knew that helping with his medical knowledge on occasion was the price he would pay for having free access to the neighborhoods where people needed him the most. My half-brother has been put in prison for a crime he didn't commit, said Molson. His dad is a drug smuggler. The man framed his son. I know that you and the other leaders of the gang community have gotten the drugs for your own operations from David Ramsley or his associates. I need to connect the chain upward until it hits David. I need witnesses to testify that they got the goods from David, not Michael. I'm hoping you can help me. I am hearing a lot about your needs. Huss took a sip of his drink. He did not offer Molson any refreshment. What do I care about your family issues? Do I even know your brother? No. Molson scrambled for something to say to convince him. That's not the point. David is no good to you guys anymore. He's a liability. He needs to be taken out of the picture. Prison would do that. We don't use the courts to settle our disputes. Huss raised an amused eyebrow at him. Yet, yeah, this time you could, Molson jumped in. If I could get you immunity for testifying, you could show up, brag to the world that you're a king, and not suffer a single consequence. Some of us like to keep our lives private. The less publicity for the police to harass us with, the better. He shook his head. You're wasting my time. I saved your cousin's life, Molson pointed out. I kept my mouth shut. I ain't ever asked for nothing in return. I always said you were more asset than a liability, mused Huss. I might have been wrong. I will always help with my medical knowledge. It's not in question, Molson assured him. However, I need this. I need to get this man out of prison the legal way. To do that, I need your help. I don't want to say you owe me for your cousin's life. You don't. But if you did feel obligated, this would be a way to repay. I'll think about it. Huss tossed back the rest of his drink. Molson nodded, not feeling too hopeful about it. The meeting was over. Molson left the booth. Retrieving his jackknife, he slipped it back into his pocket as he went to find Holly. What happened? Holly stood up from the chair as he approached, the security detail man still right beside her. Outside. Molson slipped his hand into hers, relieved that she was safe. She held on to his arm with her other hand as they slipped through the nosy throng of people to exit the club. Once outside, he pulled out the helmets, handing one to her. What did he say? Holly asked again. That he would think about it. Molson pulled on his helmet. Do you think he will agree? Or was he just stalling? Holly questioned as she got on the bike behind him. I think he'll think about it. Molson did not want to try to guess what Huss might do. That way, he would not be disappointed. It was highly unlikely the man would agree to testify out of sentiment for a cousin. The problem was, Molson could not think of another reason to motivate Huss. Why would any of the gang leaders be convinced to testify? What would they get out of the deal? Molson needed to think of something solid and soon. Where am I bringing you? Home. Holly gave him the address falling silent during the ride as she thought about what had transpired. When they got to her building, Molson insisted on walking her in. It's three in the morning, I just want to walk you to your door. It's a secure building. Holly got out her keys. She frowned as she thought, It seems to me you need a convincing argument to get them to agree to testify for Michael, something that is going to benefit these men. I know, sighed Molson. He threaded her fingers through his as they walked along the hall. I've been racking my brain for an idea. Just because it's the right thing to do ain't going to get no traction with these people. What if they did it to get rid of David? Holly wondered. What do you mean? Molson watched her curiously. I already floated that idea, but I'd like to hear your take on it. The FBI were investigating David, Holly thought out loud. The police are probably involved in that investigation. It's likely that they might be still keeping an eye on him. That means that David would not be able to smuggle any more drugs into the country. His usefulness to the gang network might be over. Then he might be a liability to them. He's probably got people working for him, Molson pointed out. 
Pop's an old man. I don't think he's out on the boat anymore pushing barrels around. He's higher up in the food chain. True, but who's the one coordinating all the drops? Holly raised an eyebrow as she stopped at her door, unlocking it. That has to be David. He didn't strike me as a man who liked to lose control of a situation. David would want to be on top of everything, in charge. If he's not able to communicate with his people, or the people he's coordinating the pickup of the drugs with, then he's useless. That particular drug supply would come to a stop. Molson turned the idea over in his mind. He was cleared of the charges. That means the FBI and the police ain't likely investigating him anymore since they believe Michael did it. Can we make David believe that the police are still investigating? Then he would not be able to make any jobs happen. Holly leaned against the door. What about Drew? Could he tell David that he's still being investigated? Drew's not allowed on the case. Molson shook his head. Being Pop's son, it's a conflict of interest. And we both know he wouldn't let it slip to David out of family love, Holly said dryly. Molson thought for a moment. What if it weren't the cops or the FBI investigating, waiting for David to make a wrong move? What if it were the press? What do you mean? questioned Holly. I happen to know how to get a hold of Sterling Denver. Molson had a slow smile. The tabloid reporter? Holly was catching some of his excitement. Would she do it? It's a story. Molson thought it would work. If we can get him to realize that the press is constantly stalking him, listening to his every call, reading his emails, knowing his every move, then David won't be able to do anything. The supply of drugs dries up, hurting the gang's leader's sales. Then they might be willing to cut David out of the deal altogether. Holly grinned. That could potentially work. Thank you. Molson cupped her face, leaning down and kissing her. Holly was glad she was leaning against the door. If she had not been, she surely would have swayed to lean against Molson. The kiss was long and lazy, leaving her wishing for more when Molson lifted his head, his hand still caressing her cheeks. He watched her as she opened her eyes, a little lost in the kiss that had just happened. I think that we were made for each other, beautiful, he said softly. She drew in a shaky breath. I think it was a very good first date kiss, and it's time for you to go home. He gave her another quick brush with his lips on the corner of her mouth. Good night. Holly watched him as he walked away, ignoring the racing of her heart and her weakened knees. Seriously, you need to stop coming here, Drew moaned, flinging an arm over his eyes against the bedside lamp that Molson had turned on. Get up, sleeping beauty, Molson told him, flipping back the covers. We got business to do. No. Drew rolled over, trying to ignore him. What time is it? Bethany frowned, looking at her watch. Four in the morning? Don't matter what time it is. Molson poked Drew in the back. Get up. There is no more cake, Drew told him. We ate it all. Go away. I'll get water and pour it over you, threatened Molson, just like Jana used to do if we didn't get up in time for school. You will not, growled Drew. Did she do that? Bethany asked in disbelief. She did, Drew commented darkly as he got out of bed, pushing past Molson for the washroom. Molson grabbed some clothes out of Drew's closet, throwing them into the bathroom after him. Get dressed. Where are you taking him? Bethany rubbed her eyes, blinking at Molson. To Max Ramsley's. He's going to get a hold of that reporter, Sterling Denver. Then we're all going to sit down, because I got a plan, Molson told her. Then I'm coming. Bethany pulled herself out from her warm bed, putting on a robe. You ain't got a lot of time to get pretty, Molson warned her. I want to get this going before people start leaving for work. Then it has to wait until the end of day. Bethany rolled her eyes as she grabbed some clothes. Brush my hair, brush my teeth, grab a bagel, and I'll be out the door before Drew. Forget the bagel. I'm sure we can mooch breakfast off Max. It looks like he wasn't starving, so I bet he's got a well-stocked kitchen, Molson told her. You and your stomach. Bethany joined Drew in the washroom. 
A short time later, Molson was knocking on Max's condo door. He was loud enough to wake the dead. We probably should have called. Drew leaned against the wall, suppressing a yawn. You got his number? Molson asked in surprise. Yup. Drew slipped an arm around Bethany, who leaned on him. Molson frowned. You got Sterling Denver's number? Actually, yes. Drew frowned. Why do you want her number? We didn't need to come here at all, then, Molson complained as the door opened. I just needed to talk to Sterling. Then why are you here? A sleepy Max asked. He checked his watch. I had another twenty minutes of bliss before the alarm is set to go off. Cause I wanted Sterling Denver's phone number. Molson sighed, annoyed at the delay. Why do you need to talk to Sterling? asked Bethany, leaning against Drew's side. Come in, drink copious amounts of coffee. Call Sterling, Max invited them. Coffee, Drew murmured, pulling Bethany into the apartment. Molson reluctantly followed, shutting the door after himself. What is going on? Paget held a toddler in her arms as she emerged from a bedroom. Paget, you know Bethany, Max introduced them. This is Drew Colburn and his brother Molson. The police detective, Paget nodded, recognizing the name. Good to see you again. Max got the coffee machine started while everyone took a seat around the table. What is this plan, and why do you need Sterling Denver? Drew questioned his brother. First, call her and get her down here. Molson didn't want to wait. Or get her on speaker, and I'll tell all of you at the same time. Fine. Drew pulled out his phone, going through his contacts. They listened as the phone rang. Hello? A sleepy Sterling answered. Sterling, it's Detective Andrew Colburn calling. Drew identified himself. Do you have a moment so that we can talk? Okay. There was a rustling in the background of the phone. Did you find any more information about the stolen drug from Ramsey Pharma? He gave a copy of the information to Agent Law, Drew said dryly. I highly doubt he's going to get back to me. I know something more about our FBI friend revealed Sterling. My source was able to confirm large amounts of unaccounted for cash going to his bank account. It's a possible indicator that he's been accepting bribes. My source is trying to crack the coding to find out where the payments are being routed from. If he can trace it back to David, then I'll have something that I can bring to Law's superior, agreed Drew. I have to figure out who he is, but have yet to contact him. I was hoping to have something in hand when we spoke. You need to speak to him. You need to find out if the FBI would give immunity to anyone who testifies against David, Molson reminded him. Why would the FBI need to give immunity to a witness testifying against David? Max wanted to know. Molson has the idea that he might be able to get some of the gang leaders who retrieved the drugs from David to testify against him. However, they would need immunity so they're not implicated in the crime that they're testifying against, explained Drew. Will they do that? Testify? Max asked hopefully. Doubtful, responded Drew. They will, Molson said with false confidence. More like he hoped they would. You've talked to them already? Drew was surprised. I told you, I have a plan, Molson told him. We're going to put the squeeze on David. I know you can't investigate him, Drew, but Sterling can. She's tabloid. She and her press buddies can bug his phones, his computers, his house. They can stalk him. That is illegal, Drew interjected dryly. It's still done, admitted Sterling. The point isn't to actually put anything in the papers, although that would be an added bonus. Molson took control of the conversation again. We want Pop to be paranoid. We want him to think we can hear and see everything he does. We want him to believe that he makes a wrong move. He'll be out in the press for everyone to see, for the police to see. Why? Sterling was curious. If he don't think he can sneeze without the whole world knowing, he ain't going to be able to coordinate no drug drops or pickups. His part of the drug trade dries up, or he makes a play that will reveal himself. Either way is good, clarified Molson. Wrong move, we catch him, and his story to the FBI falls apart. He's out of business either way. That's what I want, the old man out of business. Once his source of powder dries up, 
the gang leaders ain't going to be predisposed to like him so much. He becomes a liability. The papers let it slip that he's not so good upstairs, a little dementia in his old age, some blabbing about his criminal activities, and now the gangs really think he's a liability. I can convince them to roll on David then. Maybe they take a hit out on him first, Drew muttered. More likely he'll get shanked in prison unless they keep him in solidary. Molson grimaced. It could work. Sterling's voice came over the phone. That would be motivation to testify as long as you can convince them that testifying is a better idea than outright murdering David. It's important that they testify against David and to Michael's innocence. I can convince them. Molson was not sure he could, but he would give it his best shot. We just need to dry up the source of powder. What if David isn't giving the orders? interjected Paget. He has been under FBI and police scrutiny. He might have already delegated the task of coordinating the drops and pickups. It's possible. Not likely. Max handed out coffees. That is a control freak. He needs to have his finger in every pot and the final say on every project. I can't see him giving up control of something so important, even if he is being watched. He's also conceited enough to think that he can get away with virtually anything. Let's hope that will be his downfall. Drew sipped his coffee gratefully. He looked at his brother. Do you really think you can convince these people to testify? I can, Molson stated steadily. He would. He had no choice if he was going to right his wrong and help Michael. Okay, sighed Drew. Then I should talk to Agent Kepler at the FBI, Law's superior, and see if he would be interested in making a deal. I'll get started on creating pressure on David right away, promised Sterling. I can say a few things about Dad's deteriorating mental capabilities, offered Max. As his son, I lend legitimacy to the idea even if he refutes it. That is a good point, Sterling noted. Text me when you have time today, and I'll send over a couple of my competitors to take your statement. Since I'm involved with Jake, I'm not going to directly write about this. I wouldn't want anyone thinking I'm biased or leading. However, I have a lot of contacts in the industry who love a scoop like this. Good, smiled Max. Paget and I will let the family know that at every opportune moment, we are in the press questioning David's mental stability. Wait, Paget had a slow grin. Your mom said something about how David was going to have his annual checkup this week? It would look good getting David on tape coming out of the doctor's office, right? It would, Sterling readily agreed. If you can find out the address, I will get it done. No problem, Paget said confidently. I'll just ask Rachel. Sounds like a plan, stated Drew. He looked at Molson. I hope it works. So did Molson. If you enjoy Chapter 5 of Unlikely Hero, Book 7 of the Ramsley Book Series, look for Chapter 6. Also, please subscribe and hit the little notification bell so that you will have a notification come up every single time a new chapter is dropped. Happy listening!